Welcome to the Lone Star Keto Podcast. I'm your host, Amber. My vision for this podcast is to showcase experts in the keto carnivore community, as well as those who have compelling stories that inspire and give others hope. My wish is that no one has to suffer like I did. If you find value in this podcast, please consider subscribing and hitting that notification button. And as always, feel free to share. Thank you so much for your support. Hi, I'm Amber, and welcome to the Lone Star Keto Podcast. Today, we have a very special guest, Brian Linsky. He is an internal medicine doctor out of San Diego, and he's going to tell us about his uh, recent change to a less than lucrative job, but that he loves, and he's doing it for a very specific reason, and I think that's why I absolutely adore him. I've been following him on Twitter for a while, and he is one of the most positive, yet very open and vocal person. I've met and I just adore him. Welcome, Brian. Hanford, thanks so much. Thanks for having me. It's an honor to be here. Yeah, you know, uh, you know, obviously, you know, Tro and I have done a ton for podcasting for people. There's after we started, really, a ton of new podcasts like yours have popped up. And I think it's because people said if these two knuckleheads can get this done, I could do it too. So it's great. I think it's so awesome because, you know, really we all have our own different perspectives and, and, you know, different people are going to like our style or not like our style. And, and, and we need to have places where people can go and they go, this is my home. This is where I feel comfortable. This is just like a church. Like someone goes, I feel comfortable here. I don't like the big, huge church. I like this little small church or whatever it is, or, you know, what companies I want a small company or a big company or a big city versus small city or rural. Right. So anyways, yeah, it's, it's so awesome. And so, yeah, my journey, it, like you said, I, I've been in the, the standard medical practice for 17 years and I realized I was killing myself. And, and the more I, I looked, I said, man, I'm working 14 hour days. I'm beating myself up. 80% of the people I really can't help because they just say, throw a drug and let me eat my cookies. Right. So I realized I had to make a change and, and how it all works out. Tro happened to be a direct primary care doc and focusing on metabolic health. And I said, you know, that's what I love to do. That's not work for me. That's fun. I enjoy it. So I said, well, and I was having other things like a mold allergy at my building I was in and, you know, different things. I was like, okay, how many messes, how many signs do you need, Brian? Get the heck out. So now I'm in my own practice. I have a partner, Kristen Bear, who's awesome. And, you know, we just kind of, you know, got down to the basics and said, okay, let me cut my overhead as much as possible because, you know, 60 to 70% of every dollar I made was going to overhead. I'm like, why am I doing this? It's ridiculous. I'm killing myself and I'm not providing good medical care. So now in the direct primary care, it's basically like a membership model. So someone pays a hundred bucks a month or whatever it is, depending on age and, and comorbidities, stuff like that, and how much work we have to do. Uh, and then they can come in every week if they want, or they come in twice a year, or they can come in for their annual, but our job is to keep them healthy and fit and get them off meds as much as possible, work on lifestyle, work on all these things that when you're seeing a doctor for you know six or seven minutes, they can't talk about all this stuff about the divorce you're going through or the life stress or financial problems or whatever it is. So we're very, I'm very fortunate and I haven't had a massive, massive pay cut, but it's a pretty good size. I mean, it's noticeable for sure, but you know, it's really when you do what you love and I, I look forward to coming to work and our place is small and nice and, and everyone loves it when they come in and they feel like a spa, you know, like they feel like I'm not at a doctor's office with, you know, 30 sick people coughing on me, especially during COVID. So yeah, it's been great. It's been a great transition and you know, I'm still an infant in this stuff started in July but I love it. It's already the right decision, even though it's a, a little bit less lucrative. I, you know, I, I didn't really need that much more money. You know, I was kind of in, in a good spot after paying down my med school loans as much as possible and all that. But, it, you know, it's a it's a leap of faith for sure. And it's fear. It's fear. You know, you, you hope there's going to be patients that appreciate, especially in California, because no one there's nothing like this around me. So it's a it's a big step to step out of the insurance model and say, OK, am I going to earn my keep here? Okay, but well, tell me, I got to know, why are you staying in California? You know, we could use even more doctors in Texas. And I'm just saying I'm in the market for a doctor. So yeah, you know, who knows how, how God works and how life works, you know, seriously, I've, I've honestly considered it seriously. You know, it's, it's just a hard part of, you know, being a doc, once you're established, and you kind of build up a practice, yeah. it's a hard, it's hard, you know, because the money I would save in taxes, the money, you know, you, I've weighed out the options and looked at it because <laughs> when I was leaving my practice, I thought, you know what, but I happen to be on the campus of San Diego Christian, which I love. I love the, the mm. Dean. I love the people here. And I'm in a 
just a great place. And I, you know, I, I can mentor, I could do things and, you know, that I couldn't do before. Now I have time to do podcasts like this. I have time to do my new podcast talking about life's best medicine, like what, what really matters in life and what's important. And I think, you know, ultimately I have good friends. I love my church and, and there's certain things that just keep you where you're at, right? You go, okay, I'll deal with the, you know, suffering that we have to deal with. And, you know, I get to go for bike rides at the beach with my buddy every Saturday morning. And I get to go for hikes with, with another good friend of mine on Sunday morning. And so, um, you know, you, you kind of weigh the options and, and trust me, if things get worse in California, I may be, uh, you know, jumping ship and joining every other California that's coming to Fort Texas. <laughs> yes, no, stop. Unless you're going to come here for the right reasons. Right. But no, we could really use you. And, you know, the other thing too, is we do have some really good dance halls. So if you haven't been to a Texas dance hall, a true one, you don't know what you're missing. Yeah, I'm so gonna have to come sweet. out. I mean, you guys got there good you barbecue. Go. You have there's a lot of draws. Uh, yeah, well, and sure, barbecue. Man. Duh, yeah. barbecue. So yeah, definitely something to keep in the back of your mind. And I, I promise you would not have any problem reestablishing your practice here. Not at all. You know how many people ask me, hey, do you know any doctors in, in the area that you know believe in the low carb keto carnivore? And I'm like, yeah, I know a couple, but they're not taking any patients. Yeah, it's a hard thing. It really is. It's sad because I I would like to just be another doctor. Really, you know, it's a sad statement about our medical practice because there's people in need and there's people yeah. who are ready to go, but they're not getting support they need, and it's tough. I have people coming from you know Northern California. I just had someone from from higher than you know San Francisco, like a twelve hour drive. They drive down here. They're like, I don't care. Wow. I I want to do this and I want to get my life back. So it's sad that that has to be because there's great doctors in between here and there, right? But because of the podcast and, and, you know, word of mouth, things like that, it's been great. So, yeah, I think I could reestablish, you know, in Texas. And so, yeah, we, you never know how things go. You know, I still I have a long lease I signed because I don't want to go anywhere yet. But, <laughs> you know, at some point, really, the, when the pain, it's just like my old practice. I took a pay cut to come here because the pain was worse than the, the pleasure I was getting. So, you know, at some point, you know, living two miles from home, you know, I, I sacrificed for you and drove two miles to get here so my dogs wouldn't be barking. Uh, in the background, right? So, <laughs> you know, you kind of look and go, man, I was driving 40 minutes a day, at least each way. Uh, now I'm driving two minutes. I could just say, oh, I'm going to stop nice. by the office real quick on the way home before I'm like, oh man, I got to drive all the way out there. So, you know, those kind of life things you say, what's important? Like yes. I don't want to be sitting on the freeway, but that's where I used to edit yeah. the podcast. I would drive for 40 minutes and listen to the podcast and, you know, <laughs> Hey, let's take this. So, yeah. So now I have a two minute drive. I can't really do it. It'll take me two months to, to edit one podcast, but now I could go That's for a, a lot of work. But, yeah. Yeah. You know how it people is. People don't get yeah. that. It is yeah. a lot of work. Yeah. yeah. People don't see and, and you know, they'll no. criticize you and, and it, they don't realize what goes on behind the scenes and how much mm. work it is to, you know, get everything done right. And, you know, have an editor and, you know, money goes out doing these things. And when you have a passion, it doesn't really matter. So, you know, I'm hoping your podcast and, you know, for us, we decided never to monetize it. So that doesn't help our financial situation yeah. either, but, yeah. but at least we have credibility and there's not anything wrong with having advertising. I think, Mm -hmm. With my new podcast, I probably will if the right people come along, but I don't want them to say, well, is he pushing this product because he's getting paid? Exactly. You know, that's exactly. always a question. Yeah. I won't affiliate with anybody that I don't personally use a product myself or would recommend to my family and friends. I will not do that. Money is, I just don't care enough about it for that. And I'm like you, I mean, of course I make like no money, but this is what I enjoy. And I think it's such an important thing to, to get our message out because I, I suffered so much and I know you did too. And the things that you had to see in your practice and you couldn't do anything about it. it. It was just heartbreaking. And so if we can help somebody to not have to go through what we went through, that is worth more than any money or dollar value. I mean, yeah, we got to live, but you know, past that it's, it's, it's about helping and, you know, getting that word out there. And I think people need to know that, that most of us do not make Jack, you know, doing this. It's because we have a passion and we care. And so I, I want you to talk a little bit more about that. I, I don't think necessarily everybody knows your background and what you went through. Let's talk a little bit about your, your health and why you feel like the low carb way is so important in, in applying that to your practice where before you kind of, you're just throwing drugs at people. Talk about that difference. Yeah, I think, you know, I think the advantage I have was my disadvantage, really. And I think that that's how life goes. Sometimes you go through these struggles, like, why am I struggling? Why am I 
not losing weight. So I was overweight as a kid, never morbidly obese or anything like that, but, but always overweight, the chunky kid. Right. And, you know, even in, you know, pop Warner stuff, I had to like barely make weight and I, it was like, it was kind of brutal. And, and so, um, you know, I fast forward, you know, my family was all about food, right. You celebrate someone dies, mm -hmm. you know, someone's born, whatever, you, you know, stress, not stress, uh, football games, holidays, it was always about food. Like, and, and so my mom's side of the family was all really obese, diabetic. All my uncles died in their fifties and sixties, you know, for the most part. And so, um, it's funny. You're, my friend Tro's bugging me in the middle of my podcast. I told him I was doing a podcast right now. So anyway, no, Tro. <laughs> sorry, Tro, you're going to, you're going to have to, I'll call you. We're going to get to you later. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, and he's worth having on. He's a great guy. Good friend of mine. We, we rib each other, but we have a lot of fun. So anyways, I started seeing this and started seeing like, these guys are all dying of diabetes, complications, heart disease, strokes, disaster stuff, because their mindset was I'll just shoot more insulin, eat my cookies and, and donuts. Right. And, and they didn't realize the implications of that. It's, it's not make it's not absolving you of the sugar. It's not making it disappear magically. It's just shoving it into your tissues where it's going to do damage. And I saw that in my patients. And I saw that in myself. I was three years ago, I was, you know, 60 pounds heavier, pre-diabetic. I'm thinking, man, I'm, I'm doing the ADA's recommended diet. I'm working out six days a week. I'm doing everything I need to do. Maybe my patients aren't all lying to me that they're, you know, I think they're all cheating and they're not doing what I'm telling them to do, but they are. And so I came across a patient, he lost 40 pounds doing alternate date, basically two days a week, he was fasting 500 calories or less, no carbs. And I, I couldn't wrap my mind around it. I'm thinking, how in the heck is this guy losing weight? Two days he's doing that. And I said, what about the other days? Are you drinking beer and having pizza? He goes, yeah, I do whatever I want. But I just, I'm like, that doesn't make sense. And so I started researching who do I come across just like everyone else in the world, Jason Fung mm -hmm. talking about fasting. I go, what's this guy selling? He's selling something. And I look and he's not selling something at the end. I'm like, Hmm, this guy's kind of seems kind of legit. So I sent him an email. I go, Hey, well, what's the deal with this fasting stuff? And he reached out to me. Actually, we had a couple of phone calls. I'm like, Oh my gosh, I'm talking to Jason Fung. This is crazy. And then, you know, you know, and he was always very welcoming and saying, Hey, look, let me teach you what I know. Not like, okay, I'm the only one with the answer and I'm going to take all the patients because I'm the only one with the key. Right. So, so I started looking at that and I said, well, I'll try it low carb and I'll start skipping breakfast. I'll start doing stuff that I'm not supposed to do. Lo and behold, I start losing weight. I lose like 30 pounds in the first six weeks. And then all my patients are looking at me like, doc, what are you doing? I was like, oh gosh, here's what I'm doing. It's not recommended, but this is what I'm doing. Right. And then they start doing it and then they start losing weight. And I had 11 people come off insulin in the first six months, right. Doing this. And before that, not one person. I've ne I've always saw these flyers about people saying, okay, we'll get you off medicines. I go, these guys are all nut quack job, right? <laughs> you know? So I started seeing it. I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm having success. And people are losing weight and they're loving me and they're loving coming in and go, do you get my weight yet, doc? Look at that. Look at my weight. And I'm like, oh my gosh, you lost 15 pounds. This is great. So I had never seen that because all the meds make you gain weight. Insulin makes you gain weight. So once I start understanding insulin resistance, you know, and then experimenting on myself, what works, let's fast more, let's fast less, let's do. So I've been on a journey uh, for my own self-discovery. And, and the, unfortunately, most doctors out there haven't had to struggle with weight. So since they never had to struggle and they've been thin their whole life, they've never had insulin resistance problems. They, they can't identify with their patients who are struggling. And so that's it. I have more, I think Tro and I, obviously Tro, he was 350 pounds, mm -hmm. you know, and my heaviest, heaviest, I was like 260, 270, but I'm only five foot eight. So, you know, at that point you start realizing, okay, it's working. Now what? <laughs> now what? I mean, you realize the standard of care, you start realizing, oh my gosh, the ADA diet I've been giving everyone has, you know, 21 teaspoons of sugar for breakfast. That's not very yeah. good. 20, you know, or, or 21 grams of, you know, uh, uh, 21 teaspoons really of sugar in the morning. You're like, holy cow, how are they going to, and then you give insulin to get rid of the sugar you're giving them. Well, why not just not give them the sugar and see what happens and you don't give them the sugar and they resolve their sy symptoms and they don't need insulin anymore. So, you know, I think making the body sensitive to insulin and, and that's the big thing I learned. And the reality is this, you know, and I had the great fortune of, of being at the gym one morning and, and, Ben Bickman from BYU, who's one of my heroes in life. He's, he's a great guy. Oh, and, wow. you know, and I said, Hey, Ben, can I ask you a question? If I want to live a long, healthy life, what do I have to do? And he goes, Oh yeah, easy, Brian. Here's what you do. Five things, right? Well, number one, don't work yourself to death. And I'm thinking, Oh, I'm working 14 <laughs> hours a day. Uh, get enough sleep. It was like, okay, most nights I'm sleeping five or six hours, maybe right. If that, I don't like your rule so far, cause there's only three left and I'm, I'm a dead man so far. And he says, next, uh, you know, exercise regularly. Next, don't smoke or drink to excess, you know, next 
eat healthy foods, get rid of processed foods. And he goes, that's it, Brian. There's nothing else you can do except, you know, not get hit by a truck or put yourself in harm's way. And I'm like, that is a dumb thing, right? So what do I start talking to my patients about? Hey, look, here's what we need to do. Because re- in reality, and this is, what, this is why I did the new podcast, Life's Best Medicine, is it's not just about what we're eating. You could be on a great mm-hmm. keto diet. You could be mm-hmm. fantastic in what you're eating, but you could be mad at the world and upset every day and fight with your spouse or and boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever, you know, be cantankerous in the world all day and, and you, you spike your insulin. So, okay, how do I, <laughs> what other ways if keep, because the ultimate thing was mm-hmm. keep your insulin as low as you can. How do you do that? Right. Put on muscle mass, do weight bearing exercise. And so I've been so fortunate to interview the world experts on all this stuff. So I learned a little bit here, learn, and I can pass that along to my patients now, right? Because I've learned it, right? I, I'm seeing it. I experiment. Does this work or not? I, I don't go by what you tell me. Let me put it into practice. See what happens. If all my patients are gaining weight, I said, this isn't working. <laughs> We got to change tax, right? So, and, and that's the thing is you really realize it's an individual uh, deal. It's like, what works for you may not work for me. So, okay, what works? it's just like a religion. Like, I'm not going to convert everyone to my religion. If they're train wrecked, I might say, hey, have you considered maybe, you know, like, you know, not drinking until three every morning and see if we can get you back on track. <laughs> so I think it's those kind of things where, where you realize you have to meet people where they are and say, well, what's acceptable in life? Because if I tell you, look, you're never going to have a piece of pizza the rest of your life. That's stressful. If I say, look, just don't have it every day. And if we can start tapering it down and then sooner or later, people go, yeah, I haven't had pizza for two months. No big deal. Or I make my keto pizza and I'm just as happy and I enjoy it or whatever. You know, I think so people like you out there and all of us kind of doing our part of reaching who we can and saying, look, there's a better life for you. You don't have to be hopeless. And that's the other reason we started the podcast is one, to educate other doctors and two, to find that person who's just given up, say, look, I've tried 12 diet plans. Every, every day I see that people have tried everything and nothing's worked and they think they're, it's their uh, moral weakness or their, their lack of willpower. It's like, look, you've just been doing bad stuff. Like, you've been given bad advice. So let's tweak it a little bit. And some people aren't going to yeah, change their life, but a lot of people actually will. And so that's why doing direct primary care is people seek me out who want that. There are people who really are invested in their health. They go, look, I'll pay some money to get healthier because I don't want to have amputations and kidney failure and blindness and all this stuff. Looking down the road instead of waiting until it happens and then trying to reverse it, forget it. You, you, you want to steer around the iceberg and not run into the iceberg and say, okay, now we have to bring a crew in to fix the, the ship that's sinking. You say, okay, let me prevent this ship from hitting the iceberg. And I think that's one huge lesson we have to learn in, in medicine, right? We, we cannot do medicine the way we are is just fixing the problem. We have to prevent the problem from happening in the first place. Yes. Okay. So here's something that I, I think more people need to understand. You are a doctor. What in the world do you mean you had to learn this? You're a doctor. Shouldn't you know that? Shouldn't you know what to tell your patients? What's going on here? Yeah, we should know. But the problem with medicine is we're different. You know, the people who are really saving me- uh, medicine right now are the engineers because they walk in and they look, they look at the problem differently. They look at the root cause and they go, okay, you're having all these symptoms. Is there a possibility that something is u- a unifying force? Usually it's high insulin levels, right? So when we get those under control, a lot of the other conditions, including anxiety, stress, depression, all these things start getting better. And you think, wow, this is crazy. But yeah, we should know better. The problem is in, in med school, here's the extent of my nutrition training in med school. Stay away from fat. It's bad because people have heart attacks. You eat fat, you'll have more heart attacks without evidence, right? Eat six times a day. Never skip breakfast because it's the most important bre- meal of the day. Be- it's, there's no f- science behind this. There's none. And so when you look and you go, okay, I, if I fast for, I, I, for instance, you know, I was laughing when I first saw this, because like, there's studies showing if you fast for three days, if you're fat adapted, if you fast for three days, your metabolic rate goes up during that time. Mm-hmm. It goes up. So, okay, if I can fast for three days and my metabolic rate goes up, uh, then it's, why would skipping breakfast throw me into starvation mode when I weigh 300 pounds? Can my body not tap into that? Yeah, well, you have to get fat adapted. That's the whole thing. It's not that there's magic to eating butter and bacon, but the point is you have to be at a point where you can you can uh, uh, access your fat stores. When you get there, now it's a superpower. For instance, I'm coming off an 11-day fast. I usually don't do Whoa. that, but I joined, you know, it's funny how, how life works. The dean of the school, right? We, we were at each, each other in the parking lot. He goes, hey, Brian, do you know anything about fasting? And I was like, well, I know a little bit. <laughs> I, mean, I, would, I mean, yes. I'm little, so he goes, I'm thinking about doing an extended fast. What do you think? You know, for, for religious reasons, for prayer and fasting. And I go, I'll do it with you, man. 
uh, I'll walk you through it. We'll do it together. And, and so it was cool. So we had fellowship in that, you know, friendship. And, and um, but I said, look, today you got to go, go meat and vegetables, cut your sugar, bread, pasta, rice right now. I, it was a Wednesday. And if you want to start Monday, you cannot wait till Sunday night and then just starve yourself on Monday. You're going to be hating life. It's going to be penance for you. So I go, if you get fatted after a little bit, you'll, you'll do a lot better. So this guy who's never done a long fast before does it. He goes, I was starving Wednesday, Thursday. He goes, I was eating meat. I go, if you have to eat all day, eat all day. I don't care because he was eating fat all day. Why? Because he was so insulin resistant that he couldn't get to his fat stores. Mm. Then by Monday morning, he started the fast and thought he was going to be miserable. And like halfway through the week, he's like, I haven't been hungry one time. This is crazy. And now he's lost 10 pounds. He's feeling good. And he's, he's focused and everything else wow. is good. So it's one of those things where you start realizing, okay, if you can get yourself fat adapted, you can do a lot better. So it's not that, that, that carbs are the enemy and the devil. It's, it's, it's in excess. And people, some people can tolerate it. If you're a big muscle guy and you work out all the time and you're, you know, I mean, you, you can get away with more carbs, but there's a lot of people who have the muscles and they look fit and they look healthy. But when you start looking under the hood, you realize there's problems with the engine, right? I have a good friend who has six pack abs, but his, his uh, insulin level is like 38. A healthy person should be less than five, but he drinks soda all day because he can, he's not fat. So he's mm -hmm. like, Oh, well, I've never had a weight problem. So I don't have to worry about it. I was like, well, you're destroying your, your pancreas because it still has to make insulin all day long. So even if you're burning off that fat, your body doesn't care where you store it necessarily. It's what you have to do to get it there. So, you know, the more sugar you're eating, the more your pancreas is over working on overdrive and it burns out and you get diabetes anyway. I had 14 guys in my old practice. Th these are things when you see this, you think, Oh, it's not about being fat. You got diabetes. That's what we've been told because usually that's what we see. But I had 14 guys in my practice, less than 160 pounds with type two diabetes. And I'm thinking, how can this be? Especially if you're of Asian or Indian descent, because you just can't get fat. If you can't get fat, where do you put the sugar? There's nowhere else to put it. <laughs> it stays in the bloodstream and that, that's by definition diabetes. So yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the thing is the reason us doctors don't see it is we've been told things and we just believe it to be true without investigating ourselves. Why? Because we're always busy. The average doctor now is, is you know, they say, if you, you want to take good care of your patients and, they're, and you have 25, you know, say uh, 2,000 to 2,500 patients, which is roughly the average, um, you have to work like 23 hours a day. <laughs> Oh my you God. sleep an hour and you don't see your family or other stuff because it's such a demand on the doctor. So they don't have time to read about low carb and mm -hmm. keto and, you know, and understand what we're talking about. So hopefully while they're driving to work or whatever, they can listen to the podcast and go, okay, here's the evidence guys. And then they can either change or not. But the ones who don't change at some point are going to lose their patience because they're going to say, why am I taking more and more insulin? And these guys are taking everyone off insulin. It doesn't make sense. Right. So you can either pay the drug company or you can pay us basically is, is, is what it comes down to. And when you're paying the drug company, you're, you're, the outcomes are not better. They're worse. Uh, longevity. And once you go on insulin, your, your life is going to shorten. I guarantee it. There's no doubt about it. Uh, we see it, right. And, you know, the complications mm -hmm. and everyone says, well, it's just because they get so sick that the, the, it's not the insulin cause of the problem. And like, then you haven't looked at the studies. The studies yeah. are very clear on this. So, you know, that's the only ones that really, the only drugs that really are shown to decrease mortality, heart failure, things like that are ones that lower insulin levels directly or indirectly, mm -hmm. usually indirectly because you're peeing out more sugar. Yeah. You lower your insulin, you do better, right? Whatever it is. So the arguments say, like, okay, instead of peeing out more sugar, which increases your risk of urinary infection and other problems, why don't you just not put the sugar in the first place? Right. So, so that's, that's the, what the, I don't get. I mean, it, if you just look at it and if you know what diabetes is, what sense does it make for the ADA to recommend a, a diabetic to eat carbs all through the day? It makes no sense. Because, because they don't have an understanding of physiology. If you look at the data, it says <laughs> you can live your entire life without carbohydrates. Zero. You could go zero. You can't go zero mm -hmm. fat. You can't go zero protein or you'll die. Mm -hmm. So you, your body sh and sugar is important, but your body will manufacture that. For instance, I just came off 11 day fast. How many times do I have low sugar in that 11 days of eating zero sugar? Zero. My sugar has been normal the entire time. And I know exactly what it's going to do when I work out. I know because your body will kick it out of the fat store. So why, if you think about sugar as money, right? If you're running out of money and you have a ton of money in the bank, what do you do? You go to the bank and get that. You, you take it out of the fat stores and use it. And that's what the ADA doesn't understand. I don't know if they, if it's that they don't understand or they don't want to understand. The yeah. head of the ADA, as a matter of fact, has said like she went low carbon and uh, came off her insulin, right? She came off her meds. But the problem is when you're sponsored by pharma and you're sponsored by <laughs> yeah. food companies, really, you look at who's sponsoring them and, and you go, okay, politically, if I'm CEO of the company, 
I'm in big trouble. And this is what we were talking about as far as, as taking sponsors, right? Because if you have sponsors, now you're, you're beholden to your sponsors. Right. If I all of a sudden say, okay, I'm sponsored by this soda company, but don't drink soda anymore because it's bad for you. <laughs> And both sides are happy because if you're drinking more soda and your sugars go higher and I'm pharma, I say, oh, good. I got drugs to treat that sugar that you have a problem with. No problem. Because we've always looked at it as a, as a sugar problem, right? That, that's why we're looking at your sugars are high. We have to fix that problem, the sugar problem. But the problem is you ran out of storage units. So how do we fix that problem? Okay, you're going to empty your storage units at some point. That's low carb, keto, intermittent fasting. All these things empty the storage units. So anyone who's ever moved, just to make it in simple terms, if you've ever, ever moved, at first when you're moving, you think, oh, this is easy. We have plenty of room in the truck, right? This is happened to me when I was in residency. I had to move several times. And like, at first it's easy. You get the guys like, okay, guys, they're throwing this stuff. And all of a sudden it's like, oh my gosh, you look behind you and you go, we got a lot more stuff to put in there, right? That's sugar. <laughs> and so once your truck's full, it's really, really difficult. You need more laborers to move stuff around, take stuff out and put stuff in. But if the truck's half empty, it's very easy to keep putting stuff in there. So that's the point is once we hit that max point, we're in trouble and that's where we get diabetes. And, and so the sad part about it and the frustrating part is we could predict it 10 years before you get diabetes that it's coming. You didn't just wake up one day and have diabetes. It was a process, right? Unless it's some autoimmune condition or something weird that would be an outlier. But for a vast majority of us, if the doctor was watching, I had, as a matter of fact, I'm, this is just a fact. In the last three years, I've had zero patients get diabetes. I didn't warn them at least six months before they got it. I go, look, your numbers are bad. You're in trouble. Your triglycerides are really high. Your HDL is low. Your, your insulin's through the roof. You, this is non-sustainable. I'm just telling you, you have to change the lifestyle. And if not, I'll have to put you on drugs, right? And all those people that, you know, probably 80%, you know, I don't know how, what percentage, it was roughly 80% who, who listened, you know, and changed, never got diabetes, <laughs> right? A hundred percent of the people who didn't change got diabetes. I can guarantee you that. Mm -hmm. And so, so that's the frustrating part. And the frustrating part is doctors don't look. And, you know, in my new practice, I have patients from a major HMO in San Diego, in, in, in California. I mean, it's, it's worldwide or nationwide, at least. Um, 45 patients come to me. They pay me on top of paying for their full insurance because they have them for a major stuff if they get hit by a truck or have a stroke or a heart attack, right? Mm -hmm. But me, they say, look, my doctor spends five to 10 minutes with me, max. They never talk about nutrition. They never talk. They just say, here, eat more. I mean, eat less, exercise more. You'll be fine. Well, it doesn't work that way. It's easy. It's like saying you're drowning and you know, just breathe more oxygen than, than water and you'll be fine. It just doesn't make any sense. And so they, they oversimplify things. And there's people who overcomplicate things too, to make it so that you have to go to them. But I think when you start realizing, okay, what's my problem? You know, my problem is my storage units are full. How do I do you, know, you exercise more? You, you pulling people out of the storage units to use. Right. Um, so you, that, that's kind of the, the, the point. So if your storage unit isn't full, yes, you can get away with more carbs and, and, and more fat, but once your storage units are full, you know, that, and, and the other side of the coin is too, even on a ketogenic diet, the problem I've seen, and I've learned, cause I have my patients are hooked to a continuous glucose monitor. We can have a scale 24 seven we can do blood pressure cups and, close follow-up. My, my patients, I'm seeing them every week with, with trying to reverse diabetes. Why? Because it's, it can be very dangerous if you get too low sugars, too high sugars, if we're, we're tapering meds and we're, our goal is to get you off medications. So, you know, when you start seeing when pa patients are, are invested in, they crush it. I have patients, I laugh. I'm like, I cannot believe how great they're doing because they have someone who's invested, they have accountability and they see it themselves. If you eat a certain food and you see your sugars go through the roof, this is why I like the continuous glucose monitor. People go, oh my gosh, did you see what it did when I had, <laughs> like one of my guys, he's been killing it, doing great. He had two mimosas and his sugar went to like 350 from oh, 92. Nice. So things like that, you see, and you're like, oh my gosh, okay, it doesn't <laughs> taste good enough to do that. I'll have something else, right? <laughs> so when you see it yourself, you can change. That's why I love the continuous glucose monitor and, and, and you know, really helps you to see it's a report card instantly. It's not like you I think it's a, it's definitely a game changer and it's something that I want to do. I have a glucose ketone monitor, but it's not the same thing. And so here in the next couple of weeks, I plan on doing that just to kind of see where I'm at and then add in a few things just to kind of see, like for instance, black coffee. I've heard a lot of people, they actually really react to just plain black coffee, no cream, no sugar, no nothing in it. And so that's something I wanna test. And there's a few other things. So I think those are game changers. And, and I'm glad to see that you are utilizing that. 
yeah, I couldn't do what I do without it, really. I think it's just such a valuable tool. And even just doing finger sticks and checking, seeing where your sugar's good, yeah. because, and plus understanding it, because, you know, I just had a lady issue. She was freaking out. She was, oh my gosh, I'm doing everything you told me, doc. My sugars are getting higher in the morning. I was like, oh, good. Congratulations. Because that means you're fat adapted. Your body's kicking out fat and, and carbs that were in storage now, the Krispy Kremes from two years ago. And you're using that as energy now because your you're not giving it sugar. So it has to find a source. So that's the point. When they say you need 50 grams of carbs with each meal, they're absolutely, I can, 100% guarantee you they're absolutely incorrect on that statement, right? So just give people more sugar. Even my patients understand, they're like, I'm, I'm in a hospital and my sugar's 500 and they're giving me 45 grams of carbs, 50 grams of carbs with each meal and snacks and juice. And, and, all, and it's like, why? Because they're afraid the insulin is going to make your sugars go too low. So they give you more sugar. So the insulin does. So it's like, okay, just take the insulin away. And then exactly. You know, and, and that's what we're seeing. And, you know, you know, there's a drug called glipizide is one of the worst drugs ever made. You know, it should be off the market. And I, I believe it's malpractice in my opinion to take it because it burns out the pancreas very quickly. And you end up on insulin quicker because it's forcing you to kick out more insulin against your body's will. And it burns out the pancreas. Then what? Then you wow. need insulin because you, you can't make insulin anymore. So why don't you say, well, instead of forcing your body to make more insulin, why don't you take away some of the sugar so it doesn't have to make that extra insulin? It just, the logic is, I mean, kids understand the logic. I mean, it's, it's, the logic is very clear and it's very physical logic because guess what? I have a continuous glucose monitor and you could argue the point all you want, but go and put one on and then you eat 50 grams of carbs with each meal, see what your sugar does, and then don't eat those 50 grams and see what your sugar does, right? And I, if it would be an absolute, um, uh, miracle if your sugars went up without eating carbohydrate right it can if you eat a ton of fat it can i've seen that mm -hmm. but you know just realizing how do we minimize the damage at some point and that that's where we have to go and and saying look let's attack the problem before it's a problem right that's yeah. what my job is i'm a preventive medicine doctor right i don't want the best mechanic at changing the engine i want the guy who can change the oil and tell me what i have to do so i don't blow up my engine so why wait till I blow up my engine? They go, oh, shoot, I should have told you to change your oil. You didn't do that. Oh, my bad. <laughs> or you're bad, really. You should have known better patient. So I think that's the problem is, for instance, all these years, I would always look at my patients that I would have to put on insulin. And I would say, these guys, not one of these people gets it. Every one of them gains weight. Why? Insulin makes you gain weight. <laughs> so if I'm struggling with weight, what do I want to do? Lower my insulin level. Goes back to Ben Bickman, Ben Bikikio, who's the exercise guy. The more muscle mass you have, the longer you live. Why? The more muscle mass you have, the lower your insulin level is, right? Anything that lowers your insulin level is going to make you live longer. And we know that. If you want to not die of COVID, be metabolically healthy. <laughs> it, 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 it improves your risk significantly. I've talked to ER docs all around San Diego, and I say, who's dying of COVID? Who are you putting in the ICU? Without question, obese, diabetic, high insulin, low vitamin D. That is their, their answer, right? And so you go, okay, well, what do I want to do? I want to handle, I want to take control of those things. Of course, don't put yourself at risk, but you say, okay, if I do get it, if at some point I'm going to go into the battle, I want to be prepared for battle, right? If, if I think mm -hmm. I might have to run a marathon, what I'm going to do, start training for the marathon. So it's never too late. We can lower our insulin level. And I've seen it lower. I have a lady, she dropped hers from like 88 or something ridiculous like that. That's less than five is metabolically healthy. She dropped it from 88 to like 20 within like five days or eight days, something wow. ridiculous. 88. Oh my yeah, God. Yeah, it's ridiculous. I, I don't even know how her body can make that much insulin. Wow. But then you look at stress and life and, you know, all those kind of, because that's why I like the continuous glucose monitor. It tells me a lot. And this is why, again, you know, I started looking at other things. It's not just about what you're eating, because mm -hmm. if you're stressed, I have a guy, he was stressed, had to give a stressful talk. His sugars were in, in, in from 90 to 230. And it stayed there for like four hours. I'm like, what the heck did you eat, man? I called him. I'm like, what'd you eat, man? He goes, I was fasted. He said, but I had to give a talk. My CFO was there and all these people were there. And I didn't know. And I was stressed. I'm like, okay, wow. makes sense. So I see that too. If I'm stressed or, you know, so I said, okay, if I'm stressed oh, all the time, wow. what am I doing? Spiking my sugars, stress, stress, uh, you know, my stress hormones are going up. So, yeah, I think that's, we have to step back and look and, and really uh, as docs, really, we have to step back and go, okay, let me observe what I'm seeing. Right. I mean, all the time you hear the guys went randomized controlled trials. I'm not, you know, I'm not believing on this stuff. And you know, I've had patients lose 200 pounds. I go, you did it the wrong way. It's like, they've had sustained weight loss for three years and they did it the wrong way. Show me your numbers. Right. Cause I know the numbers cause I've done it. I've been there. <laughs> you know, you do a liquid diet, you'll lose hundred pounds, 150 pounds, whatever. 
within six months, you will gain that weight back. Why? Exactly. Why? Because it doesn't work because it's not sustainable and you've lost 24% of your muscle mass mm -hmm. <laughs> and you lose muscle mass. Guess what that is? Your metabolism. So if I can have it say, look, let's focus on bringing the visceral fat, the dangerous stuff first, which is what the ketogenic diet generally does. You may not have a lot of weight loss, believe it or not, but you're putting muscle mass on. Guess what? Mm -hmm. You're metabolically healthier. Your insulin's dropping. Your, your, your uh, you know, triglycerides, everything is getting better. So as a doc, I say, what, what, what do I fear the most? And what do doctors never check, which makes me absolutely nuts. That's why I have this one HMO. They will, they refuse to check a, a fasting insulin level. That is my most valuable tool. Cause that tells me wow. a heck of a lot about your metabolic health, no matter what your three months sugar average is, cause that's going to lag. So they come to me because no one will order it. No one will order a coronary calcium score. It's like, okay, guys, thank you. Because I could take care of the patient and they're benefiting because their patient's getting, you know, they're not paying for the care that the patient's getting from me, the patient is. And so they're getting a healthier patient walking back in the door. So I've had patients lose. One of my guys lost 75 pounds, reverse his diet, his A1C, three months sugar average went from 8.9 to 5.2 and triglycerides dropped from over 300 to less than hundred. HDL doubled. And he goes back to the doctor and, uh, you know, the doctor doesn't say, oh my gosh, what did you do? This is amazing. Like they just said, oh, okay. Yeah. Things look a little better. <laughs> right? So mm -hmm. they don't say patient, what did you do? When my patient lost 40 pounds, first thing I did, cause I struggled with weight. I said, what the heck did you do? Right. And he goes, you're not going to like it. And it's, uh, it was basically fasting two days a week. Right. And I'm like, it doesn't make sense. If you fast on Tuesday, you must eat twice as much Wednesday. He goes, I'm not hungry. Why? The physiology is when he was fasting, he dropped his insulin level. Insulin makes you hungry. Triglycerides make you hungry. He dropped his triglycerides too that day. And the next day he didn't feel like eating as much. So he didn't. Right. So it, it he changes lifestyle. So as we make those little things, whether it's cutting out soda, cutting out orange juice, cutting out different things that are spiking your sugar like crazy, uh, you learn. And so my patients always start out with, with, with sugars that look crazy because, again, the problem is, and it, it's so counterintuitive to people. For instance, Tro had a patient that was getting hypoglycemic low sugars all the time. So he brings her in and goes, okay, we got to cut your carbs. And they're like, uh, doctor, you don't understand. They're getting, she's getting low sugars all the time. Because yeah, we got to cut your carbs because the low sugar is from spiking the insulin. <laughs> you spike your insulin, then your sugar goes too low, and then you eat again, and it goes up. And then you, so he said, cut her, so he cut her carbs. She was getting hypoglycemic some ridiculous amount of time, like you know, thirty-five times a week. Now she gets it zero times a week, <laughs> cutting the sugar out wow. because people don't realize it's the sugar that's instigating the problem, right? It's the carbohydrates, it's the processed foods. So if you eat real food, that problem goes away. Yeah. I, well, okay. Here's something that kind of gets me. And I'm sure you probably have seen this too. It's like, even if you explain to somebody that, okay, look, we can get you off insulin if you do this. And they're like, yeah, I'd really rather have the cake. I'll just take the insulin. And, and for those who have really uh, high insulin needs, uh, they still are fine with eating their I'll let's just say cake and, and saying, Oh, I'm just going to up my insulin this day because I had my cake. Yeah. That's that the kills mindset. Me. That was my family's mindset. And I saw the disasters that happened with that. And, and the problem is look in the, the luxury I have right now, if I see a person who's not buying into what I'm doing, it's like, don't waste your money. Don't waste your money on me. Go to the doctor who will just throw a drug out there. And I'm, but I'm telling you, here's the outcome that you'll have. You're going to have better looking sugars, but where's the sugar going? Do you think insulin makes it disappear? And all the studies, mm -hmm. the Accord trial, you know, really, it really screwed up medicine, in my opinion, because it was a trial of looking at diabetics. They said, oh, look, if diabetics, the goal of, of keeping the sugar around seven or, or lower, the three month sugar average, uh, the problem was what they used to lower the, the sugars down was insulin or other drugs. Well, when you, and so what happened is at the end of the study, all cause mortality, one of, you know, heart attack strokes, you know, hypoglycemia episodes, all these things got worse. And they go, oh my gosh, we can't control diabetes as tightly. So let's make the three month sugar average of seven. When you look at the data, if you look at cardiovascular disease in women, for instance, the, if you look at their, if someone with an A1C a three month sugar average of five versus seven, the chance of a heart attack goes up 400%. So if, if I'm a 400% increase risk of heart attack, am I happy and go, oh, this is great. Look, your A1C is seven. So people are listening and their doctor's saying, yeah, you're three much sugar. I have seven. Great. You're at goal. 
you're a massively increased risk of cardiovascular disease, heart attacks, strokes, dementia, Parkinson's, all you, you name it, depression, anxiety, stress. So you cut that A1C and they do better, you know, because we've been so hyper vigilant about LDL cholesterol. Yes, if your insulin is very high and your sugar is very high, LDL cholesterol is very dangerous. If you're diabetic and you're not going to control that, yes, I would recommend a sand drug. The question becomes, do you want to be on 30 pills when you die or do you want to be healthy and active and playing golf, right? Or whatever you enjoy, tennis. So that's the point is like, look, you have to understand it's not just about what the sugar level is, right? And it's, and, and really is it, just realizing we've been wrong, trust me, because I get into it with cardiologists all the time because I have people, what, what happens is like that lady, her, her insulin level drops significantly. What else gets better? Her blood pressure normalizes. She comes off all these meds, sugar is better. Everything's better and she's lost weight. And the doctor looks at another goal. They think it's just the weight that is like, if you're wearing a, uh, if you're wearing a, a, a weighted vest and you, you weigh 30 pounds heavier, all of a sudden you're going to die of all this stuff more. No, it's the insulin that's changing. And that's what they have. To, that's what we have to look at. What does insulin do at the kidney level? It makes you hold on to sodium, hold on to salt, right? So these meds that make you lower insulin levels, guess what? Heart failure gets better. Guess what? Low carb diet makes heart failure better. It just does because that insulin 90% of the time is going to, you know, blood pressure is uh, highly associated with high insulin levels. So you get, you know, if you come in and stress in the white coat hypertension, what is that? You spike your insulin, you hold on more salt, you constrict the blood vessels and your blood pressure is high. If you're relaxed and calm and good, your blood pressure goes down, right? Um, like my guy giving a talk, when he gave that talk, his insulin went up, right? So insulin went up, sugar screwed up, every, stress hormones are crazy. So that's a big part of it. Say, look, let me, let me find my peaceful place. As a matter of fact, one of the more tragic things I've had just happened last week at a patient. She has a husband who's addicted to pornography. So he shows no time to her. She has no, uh, you know, uh, not a good family support, conflict at home, you know, financial trouble, all this stuff. And I go, what's your place of peace? Where do you go when everything's going wrong? How do you like recuperate? Where, how do you recover? Right. For me, it's home, right. Or it's being with friends or going for a hike or whatever. And her answer was chocolate and candy. Right. That's her piece, mm -hmm. chocolate and candy. Said, good luck. You're never going to get your, and, and her sugars are through the roof. She's, but her husband's mean to her. What does she do? She goes lock herself in a room and eats candy and, and mm -hmm. soda and whatever. And you go, man, that's a disaster. You got to, we got to figure this part of it out. Right. So it's not just, you know, it's it, it, emotions and stress and all those things. And that's, that's what we've learned on our journey too is like, look, and your journey, right? Your journey. <laughs> oh, saying, yeah. Look, I cannot I have to find another, another outlet, another, you know, I'm going to go get a massage instead of celebrating with, you know, beer and pizza that night. So it's figuring out what works for you and where you get your peace. Right. And, and so that's a big part of this is we is. found when people get their sugars, right. Guess what? They're like, I'm not as stressed. If I'm a stress eater and my stress gets better, guess what? I don't, I don't need as much. So let's work on the stress part of it too, then, right. While we're at it, the, the, the medicine is never going to fix any of that stuff because, you know, we see this trif, you know, this, this crazy combination stress, anxiety, not sleeping, eating terrible foods, not exercising, you know, sitting around and, and everything's a disaster. When they get a hold of one of them, if you get good sleep at night, then all of a sudden you have more energy the next day to do stuff. Your stress hormones aren't as high, your insulin drops, all these things, they all kind of go together. And I've had people on a great ketogenic diet, not lose weight or they lose weight in the, but they plateau and it's like, okay, what else is going on? How's things at home? They start crying. <laughs> yeah. I with my husband all day. I'm I'm always worried. I'm always stressed. Like, okay, we got to fix that problem because you're spiking your insulin. You might as well have a cookie and enjoy it rather than being stress intense and raise your insulin the same amount and your sugars go up too when you're stressed. So let's work on that part of it. And then they get that part right. And guess what? They break through a lot of times. So it's not just what we're eating, but no. and you know, our mood affects what we're eating too. If you're stress intense and cookies mm -hmm. make you feel better, that's what you're gonna go to. Just like someone else would go to alcohol or cigarettes, right? I don't think people really understand fully the impact stress has on you. And I will say my diet is on point. Okay. I could do more activity. Fine. But what's killing me is besides menopause is, is the stress. And I did a bunch of blood work just because I wanted to see where I was at and my cholesterol, my vitamins, everything were, Oh my goodness. Like awesome. The one issue I had cortisol way off the freaking chart. And I know I feel stressed. I get it. I know, I know I'm stressed and I'm trying to work on that. But in the meantime, my weight has ticked up, but I have not changed my eating. I have not changed my activity. I've changed nothing other than, you know, probably my hormones are wackadoodle, but the stress. And I, I'm struggling with that. And I, 
I mean, I do what I can and I've tried to kind of switch things up and give myself some, you know, chill time, but the stress is there. It's killing me. You know? Yeah, you know, and, and that's a good realization to have. Say, okay, let me look at that. Like, do I have to volunteer at the PTA? Do I have to do all this stuff that is stressing me out? Mm-hmm. So for me in my life, that's why I said, look, it's worth it for me to walk away. Because guess what? Mm-hmm. Having coffee with my wife this morning and my kids, like that's awesome stuff to me, man. That's that's recharging my batteries, hearing how's life, how's things, rather than saying, oh my gosh, I got two minutes, I got to go, I got to run. So it's hard to be on the run and tense and stress. And, you know, really, I mean, starting this new podcast too, it's like, man, I, don't, I have so much stuff to do, but I, I'm thinking look, someone's got, people have to find like, where do they find their peace, right? Whether it's Mm -hmm. religion, whether it's yoga, whether it's collecting rocks, whether it's, you know, (laughs) you know, cutting your dog's hair. I don't, I don't care. Whatever it is, is finding that thing and, and realizing saying step. And that's where I realized I have to step back. I can't work 14 hours. I knew I could, I would burn out and not enjoy what I do, especially when I'm not having as much success because I'm not as, uh, um, dedicated right because you can't you can't it's like if i asked you to make me a t-shirt tomorrow you could probably make me a t-shirt but i go okay i need three thousand t-shirts now you can't do it the same quality so i realized i so i cut my practice from over two thousand patients to you know i will never take more than 400 patients at a time because i can't provide good care because if someone calls me today you know i'll say hey come in at two i'll see you then right and and i have that accessibility they have accessibility to me so if i say okay i want to make an extra x number of dollars i know what i need to survive and i don't need a heck of a lot of money right So, you know, when you start realizing that, I say it's not worth it at some point. So it says, you know, you say, okay, is it worth it for me to do these, for the thing? And this is what I want to encourage you with the podcast is I had an experience where I was in, in um, Boca Raton, Florida at a talk the the speaker was great. And I knew him and, you know, went up to talk to him afterwards. And this lady was standing there and I realized, oh my gosh, she's waiting to talk to the speaker. And I hadn't spoken yet. So I, I, I said, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. And, and, and I said, you want to talk to Rob Sivas, who's, who's an awesome, mm-hmm. awesome guy. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, I'm so embarrassed. We're, we're going to have dinner tonight. We'll be talking then. So, and I start to leave. She's no doctor. I'm here to talk to you. Aww. I said to me, and I was blown away. And I go, what do you mean? She goes, yeah, I flew my family. She goes, this is my brother-in-law. This is the, and there's another guy. I go, who's he? And, and she said, well, he's just some guy. He wanted to meet you too. Cause you changed his life. And I'm like, I've never met Aww. these people. I've never talked to them. And this is the, the power of the podcast. I realized in my exam room, I might see 15 or 20 people a day, right? Or 30 or whatever, it depends on the day. And how many of those really get it? Probably 20%. But the people who are listening to the podcast are, are really like, we can help them. And so I realized like I'm more effective doing a podcast for an hour than I am, yes. right? Spending 14 hours a day in my office, like in, you know, in the dark and not seeing the light of day. I realized like that. And so, you know, we got to hug, this is pre-COVID. I got to give her a hug. It was in January, right before all this stuff happened. And, we, you know, we got to talk about life. She's yeah, I came off my insulin. My, you know, I lost 48 pounds. My husband lost 23. We go hiking all the time. We were separate, nearly separated because we had no interest together. Now we're like playing tennis together. We're doing this and we have life again. I was like, wow. I've impacted someone in Mexico city who flew to Florida to meet me. Right. It's like, wow, it's pretty, and it's not arrogance. It's just like, wow, that's, is just humbling. It really is. And you go, wow. So your podcast will be, there'll be someone on their tractor listening to you. There'll be someone who's really going through (laughs) it and something you say, I'm telling you, will, will, will help them and save their life. And, you know, that's why I love my new, I, I get goosebumps talking about it. one guy. He, he's lost 108 pounds listening to me and Tro, two knuckleheads because he Aww. was in the hospital with a sugar of 600. And they said, eat 45 grams of carbs with each meal. He goes, I don't. And his friend was bugging him for six months to listen to the podcast. He started listening. He's listened to every single podcast. He's like, what about this episode? What about that? And he knows it all. And he's changed his life. He, his sugars are under excellent control. His life is back. He's a pastor. He's out preaching again before he was like laid up with numb feet and he couldn't do stuff. So you go, wow, two knuckleheads like me and Tro can reach a guy like that. And it's like, wow, that is, makes it all worthwhile, right? So what you're doing now, I know it's a sacrifice because I know how much work and finances and effort and all that goes into it. But when you hear someone message you and say, you know what? That day I listened and it made sense to me and I appreciate that. So, you know, sometimes we don't, see it. and I know it happens for you, you know, cause your story is great and it impacts me. And I love what you're doing on Twitter and, and, and positive um, uh, messages. It's really important. It's really important for people because I hear it all the time. And I know for me, just hearing a podcast changed my life, you know, cause I go, wow, that is a great, I never thought about it that way or whatever, dealing with self doubt or, or whatever. And you realize the sacrifice is worth it because you're making a difference, right? That's what this podcast will do. Is we'll yes. Make that, so that's do, the whole yeah. thing that it's not about money. It's not about fame. It's not about anything like that. It's you want people not to have to struggle like you did. I, I, even the person 
And there's actually a person I dislike right now, which I, I don't like normally dislike people. I would not wish that on them. Exactly. I would not wish what I went through on them. Even if I dislike, and like I said, there's one person I dislike right now, but whatever. <laughs> Hopefully it's not me. Hopefully no, it's not me. You know, <laughs> no, you know, I love you. <laughs> yeah, no, but, but I think that's it. And I think you, you know, you, that that's the truth. And I think, you know, for me, I look at it and it, and it makes me sad because I think, gosh, darn it. Because I, you know, I become a little more cynical in my now that I'm 50, right? I look and I'm like, what's your motivation for really attacking this guy who, you know, it's the same yes. thing. You realize these people, I, I always, it's always bothered me. And that's really why I did the new podcast. I'm like, how can people be so negative? Like someone like you, who, how much have you lost? Like weight wise? Uh, well, from my heaviest, um, half my weight, I was like yeah. over 240 and I lost over 120 something like pounds. So. so you look at that and you go, look, someone who's lost, like you've lost way more than I have. Right. Cause I didn't have as much to lose apparently, but you know, it's one of those things where, where someone like you does that and someone will post a picture of themselves that they've lost half their body weight, which is a miracle. And someone will go, Oh, look, you have loose skin. That's so gross. Right. Why? Why is that I person, don't know. but, but I feel oh. bad for that person. Cause there's so many great people out there that I yes. see and I go, wow, they're an inspiration. And then you bring them down. Why? Because you can't be happy with yourself. Right. So I think I've had that happen on my podcast where I've had a guest on and then these little crappy comments under like, Oh, do you really think they need to be representing carnivore or, you know, Oh, wow. The, I was horrified. I deleted it, but I was like, why? why? Hey, why well, would somebody do you know, that? I that, don't understand. That's how I look at life, right? When I started low carb, right? I was like probably 20, 30 pounds heavier than I am now. But I'm like, I don't want to be a representative. They're going to look at me and go, this is the guy? Like, really? Seriously? But it's one of those things. Like, you have to look at the, where someone is in their life journey. And that's what I've learned. You know, it's like, look, don't judge people. Say, hey, if you're the, like, as a matter of fact, a good friend of mine, we go for bike rides every Saturday, as I mentioned. And one day we were riding, he's like, you know, we're riding next to you. We have a little live discussion, whatever. Uh, he has a lot of wisdom. And, and it was one of my favorite guys. And he looked at me and goes, oh my gosh, look how big these girls are that are coming towards us. And I was like, hey, um, he goes, why are they basically was saying like, what are they doing? And I go, look, man, you don't know where they're in their journey. They could have lost 200 pounds each already. They may be starting their journey and they're going to kill it. They may have struggles. I mean, you, you, you just like a spiritual perspective, no one's perfect. I mean, you look around the church, a lot of us are losers. You know, we have life struggles and we're going through stuff and not everyone's arrived. And so you go, look, just love them where they're at, right? I'm like, have you ever thought that they're doing it? They're not sitting on their couch right now. They're doing it. They're, they're, they're taking an effort out. So when you look at any, and seriously, a week later, he can, he goes, man, he goes, you messed up. He goes, seriously, he goes, I feel so bad about my, he goes, I look at people now differently just because that one thing you told me, I'm like, good, that's what we're here for. Right. Because he, he was thinking like they're wasting their time. I go, no one's wasting their time. Like when you started your journey, people would look at you and say, you're doing it wrong. That's why I have to tell my patients, look, everyone who thinks there's an expert saying you're doing it wrong. And then in three months, they're going to come back and ask you. So now my old partners who thought I was nuts two or three years ago are saying, Hey, uh, what's an insulin level? What's this? Because they're realizing, Hey, I'm having success. Like they thought I was, could you imagine? They all thought I was going through a midlife crisis. They go, you're leaving a practice where you're the number one income earner. And I go, it's not about the money at some point. It's, it's about what impact I can have. So when you live your life that way, I think if you follow your dream and you go, look, I have passion for this. There's no question I'm passionate about it, right? And I love it. Every day I sit here, I'm like, I'm getting paid for this and I'm helping people. Are you kidding me? And I'm seeing the fruit of my labor because, you know, I can't do anything unless my patients invested with me, unless I get them to buy into what I'm saying, because if they don't believe they're not going to do it. So someone like you, they're going to say, look, here's a person who's, who's lost 125 pounds, half her body weight, all this stuff. Like, maybe she knows something. Maybe you have some wisdom, right? Maybe you're not perfect yet as, I, as I, I'm not perfect. So you go, okay, but I'm on the journey, right? And so I, if it's not working, we'll change what we, a variable and see what happens. Like for instance, as an example, I, I've been doing one meal a day. You know, I just, for people who don't know, that's just dinner at night, right? So I don't eat all day. I'm busy. And, and so my weight plateau and I was sitting there like, hmm. Then I do this, this thing and I crush all my, all the, uh, those numbers I wanted to see on the scale. I crushed them all because fasting works for me. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I love what you're doing. I think it's, you know, it's great. I think getting the message out, you know, and, and hopefully a lot of our listeners come over and start listening to you. And, and, you know, I, I think we all have yes, a, a different do. journey. <laughs> Yeah, it, please it, do. It's really so true. It really is. And I'll tell you something that I look forward to seeing um, that you and Tro both do. And it's so genuine too. And this is what pulled me in is y'all really, really, really care about your patients. And you have a, both of y'all have this joy 
when you see these improvements. Y'all have even been in tears because you were so happy uh, for these people and, and their improvements. And that just, uh, I mean, it gets me every time because I can tell that it is so, so from your heart that you, you're happy for these people. And you just don't see a lot of that anymore. Yeah. And that's a problem. You know, I think that that's one thing I've seen. Cause I've, I've actually had good friends call me like, Brian, what's that? What the heck's wrong with you, man? You're promoting all these different podcasts. You're promoting like your competitors. I'm like, yeah, I don't make any money off my podcast, first of all, but it's the more the merrier. Cause if people don't like my style, they'll love your style. They'll love your message or they'll love Cynthia Thurlow. I love her podcast. Oh I yeah. Love, she's awesome. You know, and all these people I get grants and, and a lot of my guests have come from her podcast. Cause I go, I love that person. They sound cool. Right. So I think that's it is we all, if we get to that point, because I'm kind of paying back to a degree because I now have a platform. Guess who gave me my first platform? Uh, the two keto dudes. Yeah. They go, come on, on Brian oh. talk. And I'm like, you guys don't know if I'm crazy. You don't know me. They go, come on. Cause I just <laughs> wanted to like do a little advertising for a, a talk I was giving for free. Right. And they go, come on talk about it. as long as you're not selling ketones or selling us something I'm like, no, I'm not selling anything at all. But I'm just saying, when you see that you go, okay, let me see how many people I can help. So Talks I've given three years ago, four years ago, five years ago, for, or maybe not five years ago, but for free, I have patience now because they said, I heard that talk you gave three years ago and I really liked your style, right? So those things, throwing it out there and, and realizing, wow, I really helped someone. Like this lady I ran into and she goes, oh my gosh, I was at that talk three years ago you gave at the church. She goes, I've lost 85 pounds. I'm like, oh my gosh, right? And I wasn't even her <laughs> doctor, but she goes, it made sense to me, right? So that's what I mean, people who... You, what we're really, I think, what I feel is like, I want to give people hope. I want to give people faith yes. and hope and say, look, yes, yes, yes. If they don't believe what I'm doing, like what I'm trying to achieve. And, and so meeting with people every week, sometimes just getting in their brain, go, look, please stop weighing yourself five times a day. You're, you're spiking your cortisol. You're getting, it's not going to change in a day, right? It's not going to change, right? So I think those kind of things you start when you start saying, hey, look, I'm here to support you. Let's, let's see what works for you because the biggest thing, I, and it's funny because Tro and I get called zealots a lot. They go, you guys are just low carb zealots. Like, no, it's not true. It's really not true. It's like, what works for my patient? If I tell my, like, I have a guy struggling with alcohol. And I go, well, can, can, you know, I, and him and his wife, and she struggles with obesity. So I'm like, hey, can you cut your alcohol instead of having wine every night? Can we, are you the person who can have it one glass every night instead of four glass or every other night instead of four glasses a night? Because if I tell him no wine right now, it's going to be hard. But he right. may be the guy and I have other guys who go, you know, alcohol is a problem. I'm stopping. Because it's not that carbs are evil. It's not that anything is evil necessarily. It's it's do you have it doesn't have control of your life. So if I am addicted to mm -hmm. chocolate and 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 like this lady, she's addicted physically and, and mentally addicted to chocolate. So do I tell her, yeah, just have chocolate in moderation? Nope, because you can't. <sighs> no. You can't. No. And some people can have one drink. Like I have a friend who's an alcoholic and and he has one drink, you know, a month. His wife goes, You can have one glass of wine and no and, and he sticks to it. So it's working for him, but that's a rare case. Yeah. Very uh, rare. <laughs> and, and, and it's, it's a, you know, it's like, it's dangerous because most of the time you have one drink, like my patients who've blown it every time, almost every time they have a drink and they go, you know, screw it. It's midnight. Let, or, let's live it up tonight. We'll get back on it tomorrow. And all of them did get back on it tomorrow, but you know, they made bad choices. They had French fries and, and chicken wings at one in the morning with their friends, but it was their high school buddies. They haven't seen in 10 years. So who cares? Live your life. It's going to happen sometimes. Right. So it just depends if you're that one who's addicted or not. And, I, and really, my patient, I go, you look, you know yourself. Can you have one cookie and not have 20 cookies, right? And, and so, if, you know, the, the minimal damage from one cookie, but 20 cookies, there's going to be maximal damage. So I think it's those things, we, we, learning yourself, learning your patient, say, okay, because for some people, if you say, for instance, a marathon, if you go, okay, Brian, we're going to run a marathon tomorrow. I'm like, forget it. I can't do it. Okay. Okay. We're going to start training tomorrow. And then in two months, we're going to run the marathon. Right. And then it's like, Oh, I can do that. That makes sense. Right. So, you know, it, it's really saying what, who's that. And I have some patients that I go, look, let's get the continuous it's Wednesday. Let's get the continuous glucose monitor. One of my most successful patients. And I go, let's just get it on you today and eat your normal diet until Monday. And then we'll start Monday. Right. So we, and he goes, I'm starting today, doc. That's it. No, I'm not, I'm not, I know my situation. I'm not doing it anymore. But, you know, some of those people, if I wait till Monday, they'll see that their sugars are absolutely crazy. And then they see when they go low carb, how it flattens out and everything gets better. 
So sometimes seeing that's helpful or letting them go through that. And they, if they say, I want cookies one day or whatever they have, and they go, I didn't enjoy it. It wasn't as good as I thought it was. And, and it gets it out of their system. They're done. Right. Because they go, I felt terrible. The next day I was starving the first thing in the morning. So we've all had experiences like that. And I think being able to be, yeah. to realize, look, this is your lifestyle. Like for you, if you go, look, I'm getting a little weight. So, okay, maybe I'll throw in intermittent fasting here and there. So, cause some people say, look, I like to have pizza once a month with my friends and I, okay, then fast, you know, fast a little bit. And, and so if that works for you, great, we can work that out. Let's, let's see what works in your lifestyle to make it happen. Right. And you already said the problem stress. Okay. Let's work on the stress level. Great. Mm -hmm. You, you said it, right. So you go, that's contributing. Okay. Let's work on that. What can I do? And so for you yeah. sit in your, and I love journaling. There's so many tools we have that are mm -hmm. fantastic because it's amazing to me. I mean, as a matter of fact, you know, one of my favorite, like you talked about us getting emotional. I got emotional because at, probably five years ago, I had this vision. I told my wife and I wrote it down, not a vision, but like a, like, man, I, I would love that. And I was like, I was the heaviest I ever was in my life at that time. And so I go, it would be so great to be a doctor and have your patients that you can just go on hikes with them and walks and spend time and talk about life and not be stuck in a little room. Cause I hate being stuck in a little room. I saw time. that. that, that and it happened. And my wife oh. looked at me on our walk and like, I got choked up because she said, yeah. This is exactly what you talked about. This is exactly <laughs> I'm out there with, you know, 15 patients and we're talking about life and I'm learning from them and they're asking me stuff and we're out walking, we're exercising, we're getting healthier together and we're getting the light of the sun and we're, we're seeing the birds and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And it's like, wow, this is such an honor and such a privilege. And like I was called at a time when I never thought that would really happen, but I'm like, that would be so cool, wouldn't it? So now I make Tro jealous because he's like, dang it, Brian, you can do it for me. <laughs> but then, you know, he's doing group classes, he's doing Zoom and we have Zoom meetings. And so people go, gosh, I thought I was the only one struggling. And, and you know, we say, wow, that's how you do it. Because some people are just like we were saying with those ladies, some people are farther down the line. And like you, you could reach back and help others. And you may have other people you look to and go, hey, I, I'm trying to get these last 10, 15 pounds off, right? But realizing where you can't, part of it is in life, like what you is realizing how, what your journey has been. Like you're like close to the peak, right? And, and when, when, when things get hard, you look back and go, crud, I came far. Like, you know, looking at <laughs> that way, right? Losing a hundred, I mean, that's like crazy. Like, that's crazy to me that what, what you've accomplished. And that's why it's so awesome. I love it because you can give other people hope and you learn. We learn more stuff. I thought for sure two months ago. Now I go, eh, maybe not. Maybe it is. Maybe it's not, you know, that kind of thing. So, you know, but I, I appreciate you having me on because anything we can do to help you, because, you know, I know you have a great message and you care about people and, and uh, you know, and I don't know if you have Patreon and all that stuff and, you know, that to help, that may be something to do just to, just to help you with, you know, cause you have to pay people to edit it and to do stuff. And it, it, it's, it's one of those things. And, you know, I haven't taken a dime from the podcast that we do, you know, even though we had almost 3 million downloads, but, oh, man. but, but our Patreons are keeping us going because then it's not, oh, it, it was a good. financial struggle at this point. I'd be like, forget it. I can't go bankrupt, or, you know, at some point, but yeah, so they've kept us going. So I'm very appreciative for that. And, you know, cause you have people who, who really believe in what you're doing, you know, and seeing it and, you know, it's hard to one person put it all in the back, but if all of us throw in two bucks or whatever, we, we, we could float the boat and keep you, you know, getting guests on and doing that stuff. I wouldn't turn it down, but I'm just saying, <laughs> Hey, speaking of what, before we go, I know. We're, okay. Before we go, I really kind of want to get into the whole bromance between you and Tro. I kind of watched it happen, and I just thought y'all were so dang funny, going back and forth on Twitter all the time. How did y'all's relationship start? And talk a little bit more about your podcast, The Low Carb MD, that you co-host with Tro. Yeah. Tro's like, you know, it's funny. Cause he, you know, I, I kind of tease him. Like I'm like the old dog who's kind of seen it all. And he's like the little puppy that kind of will bite you sometimes when you don't want puppy. him to bite. And you know, I kind of tease him. like to bite. But, but the reality is Tro's one of the most brilliant people around really. I mean, his brain is, and, and I know his integrity, I know his heart. And, and so it's an honor to, to really be on the podcast. Us guys are kind of like we rib each other. And when we first started, like Tro and I, like we rib each other because we know each other, right? And you can get away with it when you love someone and they know you love them and, and you're not really meaning it, you know? So I took a lot of heat, actually. They go, you're mean to Tro. And then Tro would take a heat. They go, you're mean to Brian. And it's not, I mean, it's one of those things when it's, it, you know, we're not saying things are nasty to each other. We just kind of rib him and say, oh, look, you should know this better. Because I've learned a great deal from Tro. And he's learned a great deal from me in life stuff. And I've learned a lot from him and in, in uh, medicine, right? So um, I think, you know, the big thing is I, I was looking for a whole, what happened is the two keto dudes said, man, Brian, you should do your own podcast. We need a doctor talking about this stuff. 
I was like, I don't want to do it by myself. It's going to be boring. And I had never done anything. So it was, you know, how it is, it's outside your comfort zone. I'm like, I don't want to do it by myself. I want to find someone. So I was looking at different people and kind of vetting them in my brain. I go, would this be a good host? No, no, this one. So true. I'm like, this guy's kind of a hothead. He's a New Yorker, you know, <laughs> tells people off F off. And he, he's a different style than me. Um, but what I noticed was one day he put down there that he was running on the treadmill. It's kind of the same story. He was running on the treadmill and he, he was 350 pounds for people who don't know his story. Now he's, he's, you know, less than 200 pounds and, you know, very fit running marathons, things like that. And so he's running on the treadmill one day and these two guys behind him were saying, gosh, look how fat that guy is. He's why he's wasting his time. Why is he even here? Kind of like what my friend was saying. And Tro felt shame and guilt. He goes, I wanted to leave and I was embarrassed. And I, I knew they were talking, but then he looked down and saw his body and said, they're not talking about me. And when he posted that, I go, that's the guy I want for the podcast. Cause he gets it. He understands. He knows what it's like that shame and guilt and all that stuff we feel. Cause I felt that way too, being a doctor overweight and people go, doctor, how do I lose weight? And I'm like, well, if I knew I'd be telling you, cause it's not working what I'm doing. And then when it started working, then I had more credibility with people. Right. So that was Tro, and that's why I picked him. I go, look, that's the guy. So I called him. I go, hey, Tro, man, we don't know each other, but I love your stuff. You're a little, you know, and I, <laughs> the funny part is I go, look, uh, you know, th you're a little out there, man, because the, the big thing we have to have is credibility. If we're cussing at people and yelling, you lose credibility. He still hasn't listened 100%, but he's 90% better. But it's one that, but he's in New York. He was, this is how we communicate, right? So that's what happened. Then we started having, a, we started realizing doing the podcast together that we both like really cared about each other and really had good um, intentions and integrity and all that. And then, so we, we were actually going to be called keto quacks because, you know, everyone said keto quacks. And then Jason calls me, I, I, I reached out to Jason. I go, Jason, look, I'm starting a new podcast. It would be really helpful if we had John, cause we'd get some of your followers, you know, it would help us just to get up and running. And so he called me back and he goes, Hey, Brian, I really don't want to do your podcast as a guest. And I go, no, I get it, man. Your credibility. I get it. And he goes, no, I want to collaborate with you. Right. We, we would like to do something. And I'm like, cool. So let me call Tro. So I go, Tro, look, Jason's a respected guy. You cannot do the stuff you're doing. Cause you're going to lose it. He's going to, and, and uh, Jason's like, I really don't care about that stuff. He goes, but you know, we have to remain free of corporate interests and we can't do sponsorships. Tro and I may have run it a different way. Um, so having integrity, you know, his leadership and integrity and saying, you can't call it keto quack. You guys want to be taken serious. Right. So it took us like five days to come up with low carb MD, uh, which is funny. Cause at the time I didn't know, realize that Tro was a DO and I'm like, Oh my gosh, we got low carb MD. We should go low carb MD DO or something. Right. <laughs> but anyways, it's just funny how, you know, how we just merge and, you know, he, he, he is brilliant in, in taking care of patients and he loves his patients and he has compassion. I saw that in him and I go, that's the guy. Right. And just this morning, I was thinking, man, I'm so glad that he was the guy. And it's like, he's influenced my life and I've influenced his. So that's what it's about really. And, and uh, you know, him being a mentor for me saying, okay, Brian, here's how it goes. Cause I probably wouldn't be doing what I'm doing now if Tro's not in my life. Right. Because mm -hmm. he knew about direct primary he goes, Brian, you're killing yourself. You can't be working 14 hours. Cause I'm like, my schedule is crazy. I'm like, Tro, look, dude, let me tell you my schedule. And he goes, Brian, what about your family? What about life? What about, you know, do what I'm doing. And so, so he helped me a lot from that standpoint, you know? And wow. so that's why, I mean, and we have a utmost respect and we're, you know, consider ourselves brothers. And we, you know, we just had a podcast talking about our mania and, and, you know, that, that it showed his substance of, you know, com, you know, his compassion, caring about what's happening there. And so we had an emotional podcast talking about what's happening in the United States and it's outside low carb, but it, it, it affects us. It's still really right. important to get those messages out. Um, even though some people may not like the the message. And I think that's where, you know, we've had times we go, Tro, this one's not going to be a popular mm -hmm. message. One of my favorite podcasts is episode number 13, talking about food addiction and that time and pornography and, and alcohol abuse and how it all ties together man, we took heat for that one, but it was right. Really? I mean, we have guest after guest now saying, yep, that's absolutely correct. Right. Wow. Even though these quote experts were saying that we should have our license revoked for even wow. discussing this. Really? We took that's, it. And that that's... was just a few years ago. Right. And now you wow. see how much data is out there that they go, yes. oh, we're right. We're not going to gloat, but we're right. Well, I, I see, you know, some comments and, and things that have happened because you are being more vocal and you're kind of like, I don't really care. I'm going to say what I'm going to say, because this is my truth. This is whatever. And, you know, you've got a little bit of flack from that and people kind of 
take some of the things you say and, uh, and make assumptions, even though you never said anything. And so you, you did a post not too long ago about, ooh, we're going to see how many uh, followers we can lose <laughs> after doing, you know, whatever. And uh, th I think that's so sad that that's the way it is now that you can't even say anything without it being twisted into something it was never intended to be. Yeah, I think when people don't have an argument, they try to do that. They'll twist your words and go, that's not what I said, right? That's not what I said. And so they try to make it sound like, oh, you think you have the only way or whatever. So what I said that was controversial was talking about faith and hope. And I made a joke because I said, look, right now we need faith. We need hope. We need something. Even if it's not the same faith I have, obviously, like everyone doesn't have to have my faith. But the point is, you need something that gets you out of bed in the morning where you say, hey, mm -hmm. I can make the world a better place and I can be positive. And so the joke I made was saying like, Tro says the F word all the time and no one says anything. I say faith. And all of a sudden there's a three day Twitter war because I said faith. I go, prove your faith to me. I'm like, I don't want to prove my faith. I'm just saying, hey, I have faith when I get, I just know what it is for me. I don't care what, what yours is. I hope it is. I hope you have some faith or something that you believe in. And then I said hope. And I'm like the other four letter word, no one says a word. If I say hope, people flip out. They go, you're giving people hope in these days. It's a terrible time. It's like, well, I want to give some hope. Because without hope, I don't know anyone who, who's attempted suicide who hadn't lost all hope. And our suicide rate's going through the roof. So we have some, some responsibility, whether people want to hear it or not, to speak truth. And so, you know, when you say, I'm not just going to step in and, and kind of you look at stuff and you go, this doesn't make sense. So if it doesn't make sense, I have to say something about it. I'm not, I, and my intent is never to offend or to upset people. But it's the same argument. I mean, when you look at it, when low carbon keto first came out, right? They go, these guys are crazy. They're, they're going to kill people. Like that was the sentiment and say, look, here's my clinical experience. How am I killing someone when their sugars are getting better? They're losing weight. Their life's better. They're happy. They're smiling in their depression, their anxiety. There's all these things are getting better. And how is it under your care and what you were recommending they were getting worse? And so how is this dangerous? Explain to me. And then they shut up because they don't have anything to say. So I think it's one of those things that's hard. You, you know, of course, you know, it, but the point was the, the reason I made that statement was this. Tro lost followers and he lost uh, uh, patience actually in his yeah. practice because one person said he was too far left. The other one said he was too far right. <laughs> it's like, okay, what am I too in the middle? What I mean, what, so I'm like, this, this is insanity. And, and plus if there's anyone that you agree with hundred percent of the time, right. I don't even agree with myself most of the time. <laughs> I mean, some of the time. Right. So I think it's those things. It's like, Hey, if you're so fragile, but because what I'm with the point I was making is like, look, allow people to prevent their uh, present their evidence. And then you decide, right. If you already made up your mind before, then, okay. Then just don't listen to it. If I, if I see something offensive, I just skip over and don't look at it. Right. I don't certain people. I know they're going to be negative towards certain people. So I go, I don't need it in my life, but I have all these people I've surrounded myself, right. Tyler Todd, who I just interviewed and Cynthia Thurlow, you, there's people that we like, it's an uplifting message. You don't have to attack other people to present your data. And, and that's kind of the point. I like, I love Dr. Unwin, right. They're both Dr. Unwin. Mm -hmm. Because they talk about hope and they talk about, look, here's my data. I'm like, and he doesn't get into F you and F you, you know, type fights with people. And I don't either. It's like, look, if you don't agree with me, that's okay. Just move on. Right. Don't listen to me. That's okay. You don't have, if you don't like the message, then go find someone else who's going to give a message. So I've had people that we've helped lose tons of weight and they go, uh, I don't like your stuff talking about faith. So I'm not going to follow you anymore. Okay. I, I hope I had an impact on your life, but if it's that one aspect that you can't handle, then cool. Go, go on and find the person who's going to give you that whatever you need, right? So I think it's like that. And that's why I, I'm saying the more people out there with a message, at least they can say, you know, I don't like Brian's message, but I like what Amber's saying. Mm. Or I like what Tro's saying. I like what Cynthia's saying. So go for that, right? I, I don't get paid anymore by, and I had to really, I mean, it's an ego thing to some degree. Because when I saw followers drop, I haven't seen a, a significant drop, but then mm. guess what? The next week, there was, you know, those that dropped three times that joined because <laughs> there are people who want to hear, right. They want to hear yeah. truly. like, I think people respect it. Even if you, they, there's people I don't agree with, right. There's people that have a tour. Like, it's just funny how it is. Like for me in my life, my best friend is Muslim. I'm Christian, right. He's left wing. I'm right wing. He's this, he's that. I go, he, I'm married with kids. He's single. 
like everything we're opposites and we love each other like it's like me and troy like some, we don't agree on everything but for you know you when you have a, a brother or sister that you love it's like okay and i see that exactly. it's like you're vegan i'm not cool man tell me about how you're vegan how's that working for you cool if it's working right if you eat carbs with them okay great so i don't care i mean it's one of those things you get to, and you know if everyone's like that sean baker i've had great conversations with him and and, and jason fung and like all of them are not radical they're not radical they're like hey if you don't want to eat meat don't eat exactly meat. Right? If you need an avocado is that a problem no go for it if that works for you and keeps you healthy good so but then their followers make it radicalized right and, and so i think that's the problem is that you get so like <laughs> when i'm fasting if i'm fasting i put a little drop of uh, creamer in my coffee because i like it that way. oh you're not really fasting okay i lost 12 pounds and all, you know all this stuff's happening then it's working for me let me do what i'm doing right? it's just it's the same i think though i think for me, it's like, don't preach tolerance and then not be tolerant of people because you're intolerant of my view because you don't agree with it. Right. So I think yeah. the big thing is to be able to say, look, Brian, you're off here. And then let's have a discussion about it. I love it, man. I, I, you know, you see me, I get, I get atheists after me and, and I like to have a discussion as long as it's respectful and you go, look, here's how I see it. Right. Um, and so, yeah, let me share my views, let, you know, and you share yours and we're all good. And if you don't want to hear about this stuff, then don't engage, don't engage in that. <laughs> move along, just move, move along. along. Keep scrolling. I do. I mean, I see dumb stuff all the time. I just move <laughs> me along. Too. I, and just I see scrolling. stuff that I want to respond to very strongly. And I go, no, because the sad part is you <laughs> see some of these people have a lot of followers. And I wonder why like, everything I see about them is negative. Why do they have so many followers? Like even Tro, like really, when we first started out, I'm thinking Tro had like, four times as many followers as I do. Why? Because he's more Jerry Springer. People want to see someone who's going to stand up and fight in conflict. And then <laughs> yeah. people go, Brian, let Tro just go crazy. And, you know, but, but, and, and I was like, Tro, that's true. But at some point you lose respectability. Cause I see people, like I've seen people that I respected how they treated people on Twitter or, or somewhere else. And I'm like, I just don't like their message anymore. I don't like it. It's negative and fighting. And, you know, we can all get into that. And I think right now in America, what we need in the world, what we need is people say, look, we're different, but we love each other still right? You voted for that person. I voted for that. And I got that. That's what happened. I go, Hey guys, just love your neighbor. Like whether they voted, if their signs are different than your sign in the front yard, you still have to love your neighbor, take them cookies or whatever, or low carb cookies, right? Be nice <laughs> to them and love them. And, and, and it's, it, it, I think we've lost that. I think we've lost. Oh the yeah, we have, we sure have. have Absolutely. say, Hey, look, you see it that way. What? Cause I'm telling you, I have people that like in my views on fasting or whatever it is, I, I had to listen to them and go, okay, let me, I didn't make up my mind first. I go, let me listen to you and see. And then we put it into practice and see. And if it doesn't work, I'll tell you it doesn't work. If it does, it, it, it's the same thing though, really. Like if you're preaching low carb and you gain 300 pounds, at some point people are going to go, hmm, maybe it doesn't work as well as she thinks it does, <laughs> right? So we have a responsibility too to stick to our message. You know, it's the same. I mean, I think for, for all of us, and I don't want to keep you all day, but hypocrisy is what we can't handle. I yes. can handle if you say, this is what I stand for and this is what I'm doing and you do that, cool. But, you know, there's too much hypocrisy. And when you see it, it's really, really hard not to call it out, right? Like, I just, I, and I really, like, no, I've never one time said, here's who I voted for. Here's what my political, you know, all that. Except right now, I just said I'm more of a right winger. But, and <laughs> yeah, it's okay if everyone in Texas is listening, I'll probably get away with it better. But in California, I'll get, I'll get exiled, right? I might be in, in Texas before you know it. But, but Cancel I think the culture. Is, the point is like, look, if, if I, if I, if I don't practice, what I, if I tell you that everyone needs to fast and I never fast and I'm eating cookies all day, you're going to go, Brian, mm -hmm. you're a hypocrite. And I should be called a hypocrite. But when you go, Hey, uh, you know, I'm, you know, I think it's one of those things like, right. When you see people say everyone wears their mask and you can't go to a restaurant and they're at a restaurant eating with no mask and doing all this stuff. You're like, huh? wait a minute yeah. is it that is it that you're exempt from the law or is it that you're, you're not at risk or you think there's not as much of a risk which one's true and then not having integrity of saying yeah we we, we did it wrong we blew it let's see and, and i think that i love people who blow it and they go i really blew it and, and they you know mm -hmm. just like i hope i do that too and go okay yeah I'm me not. too and that's, that's what i had I'm to at. do yeah. with my practice i had to say you know for the last 10 years i've been telling you never skip breakfast you're gonna die uh, i was wrong Guess what? Right. No one said, you're a jerk. You're an idiot. It's like, look, I, we, that was the data we had. Now it's changed. So I think that's what we have to do is stay with the data and look and look at the facts and look at life experience and clinical experience and all those things. And I think that holds a lot of weight and your life experience gives you credibility. You know, my life experience gives me credibility. You may not agree with me on everything, but again, I'm not here. Like if we agree on, I think what one of us is unnecessary at some point we'd say, well, I kind of disagree with you on that, Brian. Okay, cool. <laughs> I'm not going to be mad at you. It's all right. Like maybe I'll face and maybe in a year I'll say, yeah, you're right. Or maybe in a year you'll say I was right. It's okay. But I've learned in life getting in my old age with these gray hairs on my chin and stuff is that, <laughs> 
you know, it's, it's sometimes it's better not to win the argument, you know, let them have the, the last word and just kind of move yeah. on because if someone's already made their mind up, you're not going to convince them. It's just like, I'm not going to convert someone on, on Twitter, right? It's not going to happen. I realize that I'm smart enough to realize that, but you can at least plant a seed and go think about it this way, right? On my way out, you know? So I think those are the things and, and, you know, you having a platform is cool, you know, because you can help people in the way you see it. And, you and I try it. to keep it that way. <laughs> you know, it's yeah. like, sometimes it, like you said, it's kind of hard to keep your mouth shut. Yeah, <laughs> I'm it is, it stuff is. And I'm like, oh, no, stop. It is. It is. Help it me, is. Jesus. Help me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And this. I think that too. And I think you just say, okay, let me hold my tongue on this one. You know, like they say, a wise man thinks twice before he doesn't speak. Right. Because yeah. you think, gosh, dang it. I mean, I see it all the time. And I'm like, okay, what would my wife say? Okay. She's going to say, don't tweet this. I That's the same it. thing. My husband's always like, really, do you think you're going to change anybody's main, you know, mind on social media? Why bother? Why stress yourself? Why cause issues? And so I've just let it go. Just let yeah. It go. I think, I think that's true. Let it go and kind of, kind of, you know, live your life and try to, you know, I think when mm-hmm. people know your integrity, like, you know, I've had times where people like that stuff, like people go, Brian, we know you, we know you didn't say that that way. Here's the tweet. Look at it. I didn't say it that way. It's like, they say, well, Brian says keto cures everything. Not saying that I'm saying it, <laughs> my clinical experience, it helps a lot. So I've never said that. So you twisted it. And because you don't have an argument, you twist someone's words and that's, that shows lack of character. So I think ultimately what it comes down to look, have character and don't speak out just to be a jerk, but speak out, say, nah, that's not how I see it. That's okay. But, but I think what happens, you know, again, at, don't preach to be tolerant and then be totally intolerant of people or don't make, well, for me, I mean, I th- think the biggest thing that really makes me speak out is when I see it's something like all white men are like this or all Asian women are like this or all police are like that because I know the exceptions to the rule because I'm friends with some police officers who are great people and they, they serve valiantly right so don't say all police say this guy who was a jerk was a jerk yeah. or this person was a jerk you're not all christian or bad because this one guy's a jerk right you can't you know so when you generalize that's when you dehumanize and that's when we get to the situation we're in because Absolutely. not everyone out in black lives matter is a bad person not everyone in in the democratic or republican party but when you say this person is all bad i don't know anyone in life who's all bad or all good like we're people right so really i try to give people the same grace that, that they give me that i want from them and so that's ultimately, I think, you know, that's to me is life's best medicine to be able to realize like, Hey, we have a, I have friends, like I'm interviewing a guy today, he, he, totally opposites on stuff. It's like, let's talk about your stuff. If I see a vegan who's doing great, go, Hey, let's hear your story. Cause you can help other vegans out there. Right. Even though I'm not vegan, I don't have to be a vegan leader, but I could say, Hey, you're pretty impressive of, of your, what you're doing with life. So let's talk about it. You know, you're Muslim. Cool. Let's talk about what helps you get through hard times. Right. It's not forcing an agenda i think it's if we say hey let's be tolerant not even tolerant like love people for our differences you know we have beautiful differences like you know like texans are gonna be different than california just in how they but we're the best i'm sorry but i know i think so too i love my texan (laughs) friends i love the ranchers out there in texas doing all this stuff and you know like here's what i do and this is the way it is right and cool i love that and having wisdom and life wisdom of you know knowing it's some of these things you, you just gotta you know how life is, you, how, what gets you through life ultimately, right? So in our case, amen. it's low carb and all that stuff. So I'll give you an amen back, you know, on that. So, <laughs> hey, thanks for having me. It's so awesome. Absolutely. So fun to be Thank here. you so much for coming on. I've had a blast and I'm so happy to be able to talk to you kind of sort of in person um, instead of just Twitter. And so you keep doing what you're doing. I, I, I just love you. I think your message is so positive. And I love seeing all the improvements that your patients are making. That, that makes my heart happy too. So keep doing what you're doing and just know that at least I'm watching you. So <laughs> Awesome. Thanks. Yeah. And keep doing what you're doing. Really, it's important. And, you know, these, these startup times are hard and, you know, but, but just knowing you're a light for people and helping people. I think that that's huge. And well, thank you. you know, be thankful for your that. listeners. And I hope they give it to their neighbors and friends and say, listen to this, this helped me. This Lily knows that she's cool, right? She's one of us. She gets it. So, you know, I think th- that's really important. So we all have our message. We, we all, we're all different messengers. So Absolutely. it's fun. So and thanks so, so much. Thanks so much. You're welcome. Hey it. y'all subscribe and go follow Brian. I'll have all his information below and check out his podcast. He's got some awesome guests and Tro is a hoot. He's not lying. He's a hoot. So be sure you do that. And thanks again, Brian. You have a wonderful day. You too. Bye.